tonight. I have been looking forward to today because today I get a chance to share with you my story. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to hear this before, I came to faith in Christ at 13 years old. And I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up going to church. In fact, I went to church twice in my life. My family took me to church twice for funerals. And then when I was 13 years old, my next door neighbors came by to talk to me. And they started to introduce me to Jesus and tell me who he is and what he's done for me. And I can remember it like it was yesterday, the night that I knelt down by the side of my bed, the night that I just, I don't even remember the prayer, but just simply in a try of desperation, turned my soul over to Jesus. And what I really remember is the next morning. Because when I got out of bed the next morning at 13 years old, there was something different inside of me, and I never got over that day. And when Jesus saved me, he really reached into my sin and caught me, and I did nothing but remain still, and he brought me into a relationship with him. But not only did he bring me into a relationship with him, he gave me the privilege of now sharing what he's done with me with other people. This is what it means to tell your story. And if you're visiting Two Cities Church, we're this first six weeks of our Sunday morning service, we're describing who we are as a church, not what we do, and how we will make an impact in the Chattahoochee Valley. We're in week five, and you can see it on the jumbo banner when you came in. You can see it on the screens. Today, we're going to talk about explaining the good news. And by good news, I mean the fact that I was once dead in sin, could do nothing to earn freedom from my sin, and then Jesus reached in and snatched me and radically changed me and gave me a story to tell. Now here's the big idea for today, for those of you who are going to follow along with us. Jesus not only gave me a story to tell, but he gave you a story to tell as well. And if you look up here on the screens, the challenge for today, I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can for you today. The challenge on the stage for us today is to tell it Tell it aloud, meaning say it to your neighbors or to your friends, and to tell it a lot. Say it often to your friends. Now, perhaps you noticed when you came in that we've got some guests joining us today. There are some folks that flew here from Beijing, China, just to hear this sermon today. (laughs) No, actually... My friend Hu Hong and some of her families from the A-Plus Learning Academy came to Columbus, Georgia several weeks ago, what was supposed to be a couple of week or so visit, and it's now turning into a month because of the travel restrictions, because of the coronavirus. And because we have some guests with us today, what I've uh, asked Hu Hong to do is to come up and to help me with this sermon. So Hu Hong, if you don't mind, would you come up here for just a second? Come on up. I'm going to give you a microphone. And the big idea that we're trying to communicate to everybody is up here on the screens, but for the folks that came with you, they may understand it better like this. So would you describe for them what this says on the screen? Uh, The idea today is God has given us a story to tell, and we're supposed to tell that story to our friends and our neighbors. You can pass that along to them, will you? Sure. And now I'm going to read for a few minutes from Luke chapter 5. We're going to specifically narrow in on one verse, but I want you to hear the whole story in Luke chapter 5. And after I read it in English, I'm going to ask Hu Hong to read it for her, for some families in Chinese. So here's where we are today. If you got a Bible, we're in the book of Luke. We're in chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 1. And here's what the Bible says for us today. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. He saw two boats um, at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and he asked them to put out a little from the land. And then he, Jesus, sat down and was teaching the crowd from the boat, a pretty important uh, item that we're going to look at in just a second. 
And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they did this, they caught a great number of fish. Their nets began to tear, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and to help them. They came and filled both boats so that so full that they began to sink. Listen to what happens to Simon Peter next. In verse 8, Simon, Simon Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees. And he said, go away from me. Because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's brothers, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. And here's the key verse for today. From now on, you will be catching people. And look at what happens to Simon Peter next. Verse 11. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Hu Hong, would you read that passage in Chinese, please? Luja,福音第五章,第一节。耶稣站在格尼撒勒湖边,众人拥挤他,要听神的道。他见有两只船弯在湖边,打鱼的人却离开了船,洗往去了。有一只船是西门,西门的。耶稣就上去,请他把船撑开,稍微离岸就坐下,从船上教训众人。他们就来把鱼装满了两只船他们把两只船拢了岸,就撇下所有的跟从了耶稣。Thank Thank you. Hang on here for just a second. It's really important for me that you hear this scripture in the Chinese language, using Chinese, uh, the Chinese language on the screens, because Two Cities Church is intentionally a multicultural church. Listen to what I'm saying, y'all. We're not just the kind of folks that will tolerate somebody because they're a different color of skin or a different culture from us. And we're trying to be the kind of people that embrace, that are proud of the cultures that God has brought to our church. And we live in a global city. We really do. The entire world is coming to the Chattahoochee Valley and this city is going all over the world. So we believe that we can really change the world by just simply changing our city. And we also believe that the way to do that is to impact people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's as easy as explaining what Jesus did for you. Explaining the good news is just telling your story. And this morning, I'm going to give you four very simple ideas, very simple principles on how you can tell your story aloud and tell your story a lot. So I'm going to ask Hu Hong to jump back and forth up on stage with me a couple of times, but hang out here for just a second, because here's the first step in telling your story. Step one, if you're going to be good at telling your story, is to just simply start right where you are. Explain to people... Well, actually, I got the verb tense wrong. Who Hong pointed out to me that when I was sending some notes back and forth, Jeff, your verb tense is all messed up in Chinese. <laughs> Start where you were and explain to them the kind of person that you used to be. I want you to hear again what the Bible says in Luke chapter 5, but would you explain the correct verb tense for this sentence for me? Yes. Actually, I have my students helping me yesterday. So 
So I think maybe the fathers, they were drinking coffee, but the students, they should know, right? Um, 所以他这个教会实际上是一个拥抱各个种族、各个民族的教会，因为这个呃城市呃是一个插他呼气这个河谷有世界各地的人会来这里，所以Jack希望用这个地方来跟大家分享，通过分享神的福音，把大家带到一
is explaining to them what happened to you when Jesus changed you. Share with them not only who you are right where they are, but share with them who you are. Who Hong, can you join up, join me up here again? We're going to look in another verse in just a second, but I want everybody to hear this this point. So it's sharing with people who you were before Jesus met you. 就是跟大家分享，在你遇到耶稣之前，你是个怎样的人？Thank you. Jesus is in the boat. He tells Peter, "You have to picture this in your mind." Peter and his brother Andrew, and he has two business partners that are also brothers, James and John. They're they're fishermen, and any angler in this room knows this story. They've been on the lake. They pulled an all-nighter. They caught nothing. Didn't even get a bite. It's early the next morning. They're tired because they've been working hard all night long. And then Jesus asks them, "Hey, would you guys go out? Let me let me sit in your boat. Let me let me use your boat as a pulpit to talk to the crowds a little bit." These guys are listening to the story. And then Jesus says, "Hey, now that I'm done with my sermon, let's do this. Why don't we go out into the deeper water and let's go fishing one more time?" And Peter says, uh, "You might not know a whole lot about fishing. We do. I've been fishing all night long. We didn't catch anything. I'm telling you right now. We can go into the deep water if you want, but there's nothing out there. We've already tried it all night long. And sure enough, Jesus says, "Just humor me on this one, will you?" They go out into the deeper water. He says, "Cast down your nets," and they start to bring in so much fish that this is payday, right? This is we've got it made. We just hit pay dirt. We're rich. In fact, if we keep bringing fish in, we're going to sink the boats. Hey, James and John, why don't you guys come out here and help us bring some fish in? James and John are now bringing in so much fish that these little fishing boats are about to to sink, and then all of a sudden the light comes on. Now, the reason why I like Peter is because Peter's not afraid to just simply say what everybody else in the room believes. But they don't have the courage to say. Here's what happens when the light comes on. Peter looks at Jesus, falls down at Jesus's knees, and he realizes this is a holy man, and I'm not. And what Peter says here is, Jesus, you can go away from me because I am overwhelmed. I am terrified by how holy you are. And how wicked I am! You guys, this is the gap that every human being on planet Earth faces. We try to minimize sin. We try to treat it like it's no big deal. We try to act like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It didn't really hurt anybody. Actually, sin is so severe that it requires death, and ultimately, the death of God's own Son to pay for sin. And part of our story is to say, I I couldn't work hard enough, I couldn't be good enough, couldn't pray enough to make up for my sin. God had to step in, and God had to radically change me. Peter recognizes this because when Peter sees the fish and the light comes on, Peter realizes this is a miracle. And if this is a miracle, then that man is a miracle worker. And if that man is a miracle worker, he knows. I'm a wicked man, and Peter is saying, "Jesus, I don't deserve to be in your presence right now because you're holy and I'm not." And basically, he's saying, "Jesus, go away from me because I'm intimidated just by being around you." You guys, would you be encouraged by what you hear from Peter today? Because what Peter is saying is, "I'm a total mess, Jesus. Why would you want anything to do with me?" And maybe that ought to encourage you to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm a complete mess too. How could you possibly do anything with a guy like me? That's what Peter is saying. And I want you to say, if you're that kind of person that says, I know I'm a complete mess too, Jesus, but I'm, I'm willing, I'm available, I'm, I'm willing to allow you to use me. If that's you, then I believe He can do through you the same kind of things that He did through Peter and James and John. If you'll just simply be willing and available for Him to use you. To be able to say, Jesus, the guy that I was, the gal that I used to be, I am not like that anymore, and I got a, I got a past, I got a pretty rough past. But if you can use that, here it is. I'm going to offer it up to you 
to use it for your glory. Which brings us to the next step. We're just trying to be very simple about how am I supposed to explain the good news, Jeff? I'm intimidated by this. I'm freaking out by the very idea of doing it. Well, you just start with where you are. You start telling people who you used to be. And then the next step in this process is to say to them what Christ did in you. Notice the word in up here. Because the essence of explaining the good news is to say, somebody stepped in and changed me. Hu Hong, will you help with this one too? Thank you. Does it shock you what the Bible says after Peter realizes who this guy Jesus is? Because I need you to think about it in these terms. Peter is a simple fisherman. He makes his living by bringing fish in. Been on the lake all night long, caught nothing. I go out of the deep waters the next day when Jesus tells me to, I let my nets down, and now I brought in so much fish that I'm rich. This is what I've been waiting my whole life for. And then all of a sudden, it dawns on Peter, this is a miracle which makes this man a miracle worker, which means I am in the presence of a holy man. And then Jesus calls Peter and James and John and Peter's brother Andrew to follow him. And that in and of itself is pretty spectacular. But if you see what the Bible says next, it's mind-blowing. Think about it. We just got the boats to shore. They barely made it to shore because they were almost sinking because of this huge catch of fish. We're rich. This is payday. And the Bible says that they left the boats. It says they left the nets. It says they left the fish and they left the money. It's making it very clear for us today. They left everything right there on the side of the shore. When this man called me, I'm dropping it all to include the paycheck that goes along with the hard work that we just did. I'm dropping it all to go follow this man. And probably for the rest of their lives, Peter and James and John and Andrew can say, hey, I had it made when we brought those boats in. I was rich, but I was more than willing to leave those boats. And then God starts to work through these simple fishermen, literally to turn their community upside down. But folks, you can't miss this, right? God is first working in you. And after he works in you, now he's ready to work through you. For every person in this room who says, I'm not the guy or the gal that I used to be. Jesus has done something inside of you. You now have a story to tell. And if you will tell that story, I am absolutely convinced that he can, that he will do something through you. Because he's already done something in you. In fact, I believe the reason why he does, did something in you is so that he can use you to do something through you. Y'all, we are going all in as a church on this. Listen to me, if you were with us last week, we talked about loving our neighbors, meeting them right where they are, serving them. We're trying to make an impact on the Chattahoochee Valley. But quite frankly, if we just do good things for people and make, it, make life better for them and a a, self, uh, a, a, a healthy, uh, safe place for people to live, but don't explain the good news to them. We really haven't done them any favors in light of eternity. Now, this is the thing that we're going all in on. This is not what Two Cities Church does. This is what Two Cities Church is. We are people that have been radically changed by Jesus, so changed, in fact, that we want other people to be radically changed by Jesus. And we're not going to beat you over the head with the Bible. We're not going to, uh, you know, talk down to you. We just simply want the privilege of explaining to you the good news of what Jesus has done for us. So let me make it as easy as I can for you. The way that we're going to do that is through a very simple website called One Million Stories. A few months ago, I challenged some of the core team, would you write your testimony down? Would you put your testimony online? Share your story of who you were, what Jesus did in you, and how he could do that with somebody else. And then would you record a video and put that video online? 
And for a number of people in our church, they put that story out there. And let me tell you, for those of you who just haven't had the time or you're really, really intimidated by this, like you're freaking out about the idea of putting your story out there, this is so important to us. Check this out. We're building our website. It's being built right now around this. The way that we're engaging our community and the handouts that we're going to put in people's hands are built around this. In other words, if you haven't done this yet, if you're freaking out about how to do this, we will help you do this, but don't blow this off. It's that important to us. This is your very simple, very easy way to say, hey, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Don't have time? Don't want to hear it right now? Then can I leave a card with you about how you can watch it online? How you can read it? And for those of you who are struggling with your identity being out there like that, we'll give you an avatar. We'll make it so that it's really hard for people to find you. It's important. Listen, not for us. It's important for you to get your story on 1millionstories.org because it's the simplest, easiest way for you to talk to somebody. And if they're busy and just don't have time or now is not the time where they wanna to listen to your story, you can leave something in their hands that they can go online and they can watch and they can read at a later date. Our entire website is being built around this, y'all. So if you haven't done it yet, we're gonna give you the tools on how to put your story online. Fourth and final point, Ho Hong, if you'll join me back up here. This is to ask people, seek from people, or a better way to say this is to offer people an opportunity to respond to what you've just said. So Thank you. Did she do a good job with the Chinese language today? Yeah. Yeah. I put the word offer up here in parentheses because, frankly, I just used the word S because it started with S. All of the rest of the stuff started with S. It's not the best word. A better word to use is the word offer. You see, the word offer is basically like you're presenting somebody with a gift, and now they have a decision to make of whether or not they want to accept that gift. But if you haven't gone to this step with somebody, I'm just going to be as blunt as I can with you. You have explained about the good news, but you really haven't explained the good news if you haven't had the chance, given somebody an opportunity, offered them the opportunity to respond to what you said. It's as easy as just simply saying, hey, did what I just say make sense to you? And if they say, yeah, I, I get it. Okay, then are you willing to turn your soul over to Jesus Christ? Do you want him to transform you the way that he's transformed me? Because I'm convinced that he can do it. And then you sit back and listen. You say nothing. And you pray. And when you ask that question, when you offer a chance for somebody to respond, sometimes they're going to say no. Don't get your feelings hurt. It's not like you did anything wrong. You cannot force them at this point. You can't twist somebody's arm into heaven. But sometimes when you explain your story, even if you stumbled all over yourself and you felt like you totally messed this up, if you will just offer them, hey, did what I say make sense? Are you willing to, or do you want to surrender your soul to Jesus Christ? Would you like him to transform you the way that he's transformed me? And then you sit and wait. Sometimes they're going to say yes. And when they say yes, God just used you to change a man or a woman's eternity. Nothing could possibly be more important. This is why this story is so significant for us, because listen to what Jesus does. After he runs into Peter, after they go out of the boats, after they pull in this record catch, and Peter says, Jesus, I am a wicked man. I'm not the kind of man that you want around you. It's going to tarnish your reputation. Jesus challenges them to leave everything and to follow him. And he gives us the exact same mission that he gave Peter and James and John on the screen. He gives us the privilege, the opportunity to catch people. And sharing your story is just simply telling people what Christ did, who I was before he met me, what he did in me, 
and how he can do the same thing with somebody else. Now I'm going to wrap this up today by telling you uh, how ashamed I am of myself. Because this week on Friday, I got a message saying that a friend, not a friend, but somebody that I had been in business meetings with for the last two or three years just died very unexpectedly. I think I was in four or five business meetings with this guy over the last two or three years. And this message came um, on Friday morning and I immediately started to think to myself, I wonder where he is right now because his death was so sudden and so unexpected. And because I never really talked to him about faith, I started to think to myself, I don't really know where he is right now. And then if I can be honest with you, I started to get ashamed because once or twice in those four or five business meetings, I had the chance to talk to him, and I didn't. And you guys know how business meetings go, right? You get in, you have the conversation, you get out of there because they're busy and I'm busy and everybody's busy. But once or twice over the last few years, I had a chance to talk to this guy and to share my story with him, and I didn't. And now it's too late. And I started to think to myself, God, I wish I had one more chance. I wish I could go back and do that last meeting all over again. I wish I had one more chance to talk to this guy. I've only met him four or five times in my life, but certainly one of those times I had the opportunity to talk to him about Jesus, and I didn't do it. And I'm ashamed that I didn't do it, which reminds me there are people that I'm going to meet this week that I may have the opportunity to explain the good news to. And now it's up to me whether or not I'm going to take that opportunity Now, guys, I want you to hear something from me very clearly. I left everything to start this church because eternity is so real, because heaven and hell is so real to me, because eternity is so long, I cannot make myself comfortable at a church that just simply plays games with this. It's way too important. And I don't mean just for me. It's way too important for the Chattahoochee Valley. Somebody, when they slip into eternity, their eternity is set forever. And if I didn't take the chance to talk to them and to share my story with them, I may never have that opportunity again if I didn't take it this week. It's this important to me. A church that is doing anything other than this thing is a church that's completely got off track. Somehow along the way, they've got off track. And Christians, there's a lot of things that we can do that keep us busy all day long, but please don't ever let any of those things become more important than this thing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to make it really simple. We're going to make it really easy. We're going to make it really convenient for everyone in this room who's willing to do it to explain the good news to your friends and neighbors. For some of you who've never done it before in your life, we're going to help you figure out how to do it. And we're going to help you get over that fear of doing it, the natural fear of doing it the first or the second time. But pretty soon, it's very natural. Pretty soon, it's very easy. We're going to be the church that does what Jesus did. He went to people who were far from him, met them right where they are, and explain the good news to them. And then when Jesus left earth and went back to heaven, he expected his people to keep doing what he was doing until he comes back again. And we are going to be a church that does that. So let me challenge you. Maybe somebody in this room has heard this story now. And maybe you started to examine your own background. And maybe you started to realize, you know what? I was the guy who's trying to be a good person. Jeff, I'm the gal who's trying to earn my way into heaven by doing some religious stuff. And maybe today is the day that you need to surrender your soul to King Jesus for the first time. For many of you in this room, myself included, I need to pray, God, would you give me a heart for the lost? And now I'm referring to somebody who's lost in the woods and doesn't know how to get out. And I have the answer on how to get out of the woods. So I'm going into the woods to get them. A church that pierces the darkness and makes an impact 
right where people are. And then the final challenge is for everyone in this room who hasn't done it already, would you get your story on 1millionstories.org and we'll help you do that. You can let the folks at the welcome table know that you want to do that. We, you can follow up with me or one of the other folks that uh, have already done their story online. We can help you figure out how to do it. But don't put this off. It's too important to the Chattahoochee Valley. Let me say a prayer for you. And then we're going to wrap up with a few announcements. Father, would you forgive me? Man, I sat across the table with this guy. I had a couple of very candid conversations with him. We talked business. We met at multiple different places in town. But I never explained to him what you've done for me. I guess I just assumed that I'd have more time to do it. And now he's gone. And that opportunity's passed. And God, I want you to forgive me when I didn't have your heart for this man like Jesus, who had a heart for the lost sheep of Israel. And instead of speaking down to them, he viewed them like a shepherd without sheep, or like a sheep without a shepherd. God, would you break my heart over the people of our community that don't know you? Break it so much that I feel um, the tug to talk to people and to share my story with them. Father, not just me, but would you break the heart of other people in this room who need to tell their story and just haven't had the opportunity, haven't figured out how to do it. Would you help them to say, hey, if Two Cities Church will help me, I'll, I'll start doing it, but I'm, I'm, I'm intimidated by it. I just need you to know it's freaking me out, but I'll do it. God, maybe there's somebody in this room who today needs to go through this miracle transformation that Peter went through who went from being a sinful, wicked fisherman to becoming one of the most powerful mouthpieces for the gospel after you poured into him. And God, I believe that you can do this with somebody in this room. You'll do the same miracle for them that you did for me, that you did for Peter, that you will turn them from dead in sin to alive in Jesus Christ, if they will simply trust you, if they will surrender to you, if they will turn it all over to you. So I'm asking right now, Holy Spirit, that you will give somebody the gift of faith and right where they're sitting, they will simply cry out from their own soul, Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you. I've made a mess of my life. And right here, right now, for the first time, I'm telling you, I can't be good enough. I realize it today. I can't be a religious person and work my way into heaven. No, the system doesn't work that way. So right here, right now, I'm surrendering to you. And I'm surrendering it all to you. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do next, I'm trusting you from this moment forward. And God, if somebody's making that commitment, would you give them the courage to let me, to let somebody else in this room know about it so that we can follow up with them and help them figure out how to start becoming a catcher of people. Father, do what only you could do right now. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.